Hi everyone, so hopefully this finds you well and that you can actually hear me today. There seemed to be a problem with the mic on Teams yesterday for part of uh, the video. So let's start, we're going to start with chapter 44 and 45 of um, Black Beauty. Let me just check that I can get it open, there we go. So I'll share the screen with you. Clicking it, there we go. So we are looking at chapter 44, Old Captain and His Successor. Captain and I were great friends. He was a noble old fellow and he was very good company. I never thought he would have to leave his home and go down the hill, but his term came and this was how it happened. I was not there, but I heard all about it. He and Jerry had taken a party to the great railway station over London Bridge and were coming back. Somewhere between the bridge and the monument, when Jerry saw a brewer's empty dray coming along, drawn by two powerful horses, the dry drayman was lashing his horses with his heavy whip. The dray was light and they started off at a furious rate. So it means a, um, a person who brings the beer to breweries would have, it's called a dray, is what they're saying, is the name of their sort of uh, coach. The band had no control over them and the street was full of traffic. One young girl was knocked down and run over and the next moment they dashed up against our cab. Both the wheels were torn off the cab, torn off and the cab was thrown over. Captain was dragged down too. The shaft splintered and one of them ran into his side. Jerry too was thrown but it was only bruised. Nobody could tell how he had escaped. How he escaped. He always said it was a miracle when poor Captain was got up he was owned to be very much cut and knocked about. Jerry led him home gently, and a sad sight it was to see the blood soaking into his white coat and dropping from his side and shoulder, so he's been very badly hurt. The drayman was proved to be drunk and was fined, and the brewer had to pay damages to our master, but there was no one to pay damages to poor Captain. The farrier and Jerry did the best they could to ease his pain and make him comfortable. The fly had to be mended, and for several days I did not go out, and Jerry earned nothing. The first time we went in, went to the sand after the accident, the governor came up to hear how Captain was. He'll never get over it, said Jerry, at least not for my work. So the farrier said this morning, he says he may do for carting and that sort of work. It's put me out very much. Carting indeed. I've seen what horses come to at that work around London. I only wish the drunkards could be put in a lunatic asylum instead of being allowed to run foul of sober people. If they would break their own bones and smash their own carts and lame their own horses, that would be their own affair and we might let them alone. But it seems to me that innocent always suffer. And then they talk about compensation. You can't make compensation. There's all the trouble the and vexation the loss and loss of time. Besides losing a good horse, that's like a, an old friend. It's nonsense talking of compensation. If there's one devil that I should like to see in the bottomless pit, it's the drink devil. I say, Jerry, said the governor, you are treading pretty hard on my toes, you know. I'm not so good as you are. More to shame to me. I wish I was. Well, said Jerry, why don't you cut with it, governor? You're too good a man to be slaves to such a thing. So Jerry saying he doesn't like people who drinking and the governor saying that he still does have a drink. I'm a great fool, Jerry, but I tried once for two days and I thought I should have died. How did you do it? I had hard work at it for several weeks. You see, I never did get drunk, but I found that I was not my own master and that when the craving came on, it was very hard work to say no. And I saw that one of us must knock under the dry drink devil or Jerry Barker. And I said it should not be Jerry Barker, God help me, God helping me. But it was a struggle and I wanted all the help I could get. But till I tried to break the habit, I did not know how strong it was. But then Polly took such pains that I should have some have good food and when the craving came I used to get a cup of coffee or sometimes peppermint to read a bit of it in my book and that was a help to me sometimes I had to say over and over to myself give up the drink or lose your soul give up the drink or break Polly's heart but thanks be to God and my dear wife my chains were broken and now for 10 years I have not tasted a drop and never wished for it I've a great mind to try at it said Grant for tis a poor thing not to be one's own master do, Governor, do. You'll never repent, repent it. And what a help it would be to some of the poor fellows in our rank if they saw you do without it. I know those two or three would like to keep out of that tavern if they could. 
So that's talking about people who become addicted to alcohol, which we call alcoholism. Um, and so they found that, Jerry found that he was craving drinking and he found it very difficult to stop drinking. And the same thing happened to the governor and Jerry's trying to help the governor to stop drinking. At first, Captain seemed to do well, but he was a very old horse and it was only his wonderful wonderful constitution and Jerry's care that had kept him up at the cab work so long. Now he had broke down very much. The farrier said he might mend up good enough to sell for a few pounds, but Jerry said no. A few pounds got by selling a good old servant into hard work and misery would canker all the rest of his money and he thought the kindest thing to, he could do for the poor, poor old fellow would be to put a sure bullet through his head and then he would never suffer more for he did not know where to find a kind master for the rest of his days. So here they're talking about that they're going to kill Captain because if he sold him, he wouldn't know where he went so he wouldn't might not have a nice life and also that he um, that he's getting old and he wouldn't want him to go somewhere where he wasn't looked after. The day after this was decided, Harry took me to the forge for some new shoes and when I returned, Captain was gone. I and the family all felt it very much. So they took Black Beauty away so he wouldn't have to see it. Jerry had now to look out for another horse and he soon heard of one through an acquaintance who was under groom in a nobleman's stables. He was a valuable young horse, but he'd run away, smashed into another carriage, flung his lordship out and so, and so cut and blemished himself that he was no longer fit for a gentleman's stables and the coachman had orders to look around and sell him as well as he could. Well, that's interesting. That's uh, the same thing that happened to Black Beauty, isn't it? I can do with high spirits, said Jerry, if a horse is not vicious or hard-mouthed. There is not a bit of vice in him, said the man. His mouth is very tender, and I think myself that I think myself that was the cause of the accident. You see, he'd just been clipped, and the weather was bad, and he had not had exercise enough, and when he did go out, he was as full of spring as a balloon. Our governor, the coachman, I mean, had him harnessed up in a tight, as tight and strong as he could, with the mar martingale and the check rein, a very sharp curve, and the reins put in the, at the bottom bar. It is my belief it made the horse mad, being tender in the mouth and so full of spirit. Likely enough, I'll come and see him, said Jerry. The next day, Hotspur, that was his name, came home. He was fine brown horse without a white hair in him, as tall as captain, with a very handsome head and only five years old. I gave him a friendly greeting by way of good fellowship, but did not ask him any questions. The first night he was very restless. Instead of lying down, he kept jerking his halter rope up and down through the ring and knocked about against knocked the block about against the manger till I could not sleep. However, the next day, after five or six hours in the cab, he came in quiet and sensible. Jerry patted and talked to him a good deal, and some soon, very soon they understood each other. And Jerry said with, that with an easy bit and plenty of work, he would be as gentle as a lamb, and that it was an ill wind that blew nobody good. For if his lordship had lost a hundred guinea favourite, the, the cabman had gained a good horse with all his strength in him. Hosber thought it a great come down to be a cab horse, and was disgusted at standing in the rank. But he confessed to me at the end of the week that an easy mouth and a free head made up for a great deal. And after all, the work was not so degrading as having one's head and tail fastened to each other in the saddle. In fact, he settled in well and Jerry liked him very much. So chapter 45. For some people, Christmas and the New Year are very merry times. But for cabmen and cabmen's horses, it is no holiday, though it may be a harvest. There are so many parties, balls and places of amusement open that the work is hard and often late. Sometimes driver and horse have to wait for hours in the rain or frost shivering with the cold, while the merry people within are dancing away at the music, to the music. I wonder if the beautiful ladies ever think of the weary cabman waiting on his box and his patient beast standing till his legs get stiff with cold. I had now most of the evening work as I was well accustomed to standing and Jerry was more afraid of Hotspur taking a taking cold. We had a great deal of late work in the Christmas week and Jerry's cough was bad but however late we were Polly sat up for him and came out with a lantern to meet him looking anxious and troubled. On the evening of the new square we had taken the new year we had taken two gentlemen to a house in one of the west end squares where we we set them down at nine o'clock and were told to come again at eleven but said one as it is a card party you may have to wait a few minutes but don't be late. Has the clock 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 struck eleven, we were at the door, for Jerry was always punctual. The clock chimed qu the quarters, one, two, three, and then struck twelve, but the door did not open. The wind had been very changeable, with squalls of rain during the day, but now it came on sharp, 
Gri driving sleet, which see sleet, so sleet, um, almost snow, it's like a mixture of snow and rain, which seemed to come all the way around. It was very cold and there was no shelter. Jerry got off his box and came and pulled one of my cloths a little more over my neck. And then he took a turn or two up and down, stamping his feet. And he, then he began to beat his arms, but that set him off coffee, coughing. So he opened the cab door and sat at the bottom with his feet on the pavement and was a little sheltered. Still the clock chimed the quarters and no one came. At half past twelve, he rang the bell and asked the servants if he would be wanted that night. Oh, yes, yeah, you'll be wanted safe enough, said the man. You must not go. It will soon be over. And again, Jerry sat down, but his voice was so hoarse I could hardly hear him. A quarter past one, the door opened and the two gentlemen came out. They got into the cab without a word and told Jerry where to drive. That was nearly two miles. My, neg my legs were numb with cold and I thought I should have stumbled. When the men got out, they, only ever s they, never s they never said they were sorry to have kept us waiting so long, but were angry at the charge. However, as Jerry never charged more than was due, so more than was his due, so he never took less, and they had to pay for the two hours and a quarter waiting, but it was hard earned money to Jerry. At last we got home. He could hardly speak and his cough was dreadful. Polly, Polly asked no questions, but she opened the door and held the lantern for him. Can't I do something? she said. Yes, get Jack something warm and then boil me some gruel. This was said in a hoarse whisper. He could hardly get his breath, but he gave me a rub down as usual and even went up into the hayloft for an extra bundle of straw for my bed. Polly brought me a warm mash that made me comfortable and they locked the door. It was the next morning before anyone came and then it was only Harry. He cleaned us and fed us and swept the stalls. Then he put back the straw again as if it was Sunday. He was very still and neither whistled nor sang. At noon he came again and gave us our food and water. This time Dolly came with him. She was crying and I could gather from what they said that Jerry was dangerously ill and the doctors said it was a bad case. So two days passed and there was a great trouble indoors. We only saw Harry and sometimes Dolly. I think she came for company and Polly, for Polly was with Jerry and he had to be kept very quiet. Oh no, it's not. There's a problem loading this page. So we'll give it a moment. Let's see, what page are we on at the moment? We're on page 98. So we'll reload it again and head down to page 99. See whether this works. And hopefully the mic's still working. So it does sound like Jerry's awfully ill. Now, I feel like that might be the end of the chapter, but until I can check whether or not this is loading, I won't be able to say for certain. Sorry about the wait, everyone. Let's give it one more go. There we go. And we'll go down to page 99. Oh, I can put it in there. No, I can't. So 110. Oh, everyone close their eyes. So you don't see what happens. Hundred. There we go. On the third day, while Harry was in the stable, a tap came at the door and Governor Grant came in. I wouldn't go to the house, my boy, he said, but I want to know how your father is. He's very bad, said Harry. He can be, can't be much worse. They call it bronchitis. The doctors think it will turn one way or another tonight. So nowadays when people get bronchitis, they're made well. Um, but back in back then, it would have been quite a problem to have that. That's bad, very bad, said Grant, shaking his head. I know two men who died of that last week. It takes them off in no time. But there's well, while there's life, there's hope. So you must keep up your spirits. Yes, said Harry quickly. And the doctor said that father had be a better chance than most men because he didn't drink. He said the fever was so high that if father had been a drinking man, it would have burned have burned him up like a piece of paper. But I leave, believe he thinks he will get over it. Don't you think he will, Mr. Grant? The governor looked puzzled. If there's any rule that good men should get over these things, I'm sure he will, my boy. He's the best man I know. I'll look in early tomorrow. Early next morning, he was there. Well, he said, said he. Father is better, said Harry. Murray, mother hopes he will get over it. Thank God, said the governor. Now you must take, keep him warm and keep his mind easy. And that brings me to the horses. You see, Jack will be all the better for the rest of the, for the rest of a week or two in a warm stable and you can easily take him a turn up and down the street to stretch his legs but this young one if he does not get much get work he will soon be up all up on end as you may say and will be rather too much for you and that when he does go out there'll be an accident it is like that now said harry i have to keep i have kept him short of corn but he's so full of spirit i don't know what to do with him just so said grant now look here 
Will you tell your mother that if she is agreeable, I will come for him every day till something is arranged and take him for a good spell of work. And whatever he earns, I'll bring for your mother half of it. And that will keep the horse with the horse's feed. Your father is a good in a good club, I know, but that won't keep the horses and they'll be eating their heads off all this time. I'll come at noon and hear what he said, what she says. And without waiting for Harry's thanks, he was gone. So that's really kind. He's offered to take um, Hotspur out for a walk. I uh, to do some work for half a day and to give them half the amount of money that he makes. At noon, I think he went and saw Polly, for he and Harry came to the stable together, harnessed Hotspur and took him out. For a week or more, he came for Hotspur, and when Harry thanked him or said anything about his kindness, he laughed it all off, saying it was all good luck for him, for his horses were wanting a little rest, which they would not, which they would not otherwise have had. Jerry grew better steadily, but the doctor said he must never go back to the cab work again if he wished to be an old man. The children had many consultations together about what father and money would do, mother would do, and how they would could help earn, to earn money. One afternoon, Hotspur was brought in very wet and dirty. The streets are nothing but slush, said the governor. I will give you a good warming, my boy, to get him clean and dry. All right, governor, said Harry. I shall not leave him till he is. You know I have been trained by my father. I wish all the boys had been trained like you, said the governor. While Harry was sponging the mud off from Hotspur's body and le legs, Dolly came in looking ve very full of something. Who lives at Fairstow, Harry? Mother has got a let letter from Fairstow. She seemed so glad and ran upstairs to father with it. Don't you know why it's the name of Mrs. Fa Fa Fowler's place? Mother's old mistress, you know, the lady that father met last summer who sent you and me five shillings each. Oh, Mrs. Fowler, of course, I know all about her. I wonder what she is writing to Mother about. Mother wrote to her last week, said Harry. You know, she told Father that if he ever gave up the cab work, she would like to know. I wonder what she says. Run in and see, Dolly. Harry scrubbed away at a hotspur with a whish, whish, like any old hostler. In a few minutes, Dolly came dancing into the stable. Oh, Harry, there's never anything so, there never was anything so beautiful. Mrs. Fowler says we are all to go and live near her. There is a cottage now empty that will suit, just suit us, with a garden and a hen house and apple trees and everything, and her coachman is going away in the spring, and then she will want father in his place. And there are good families round where you can get a place in the garden, or the stable, or as a page boy, and there's a good school for me, and mother is laughing and crying by terms, and father does look so happy. That's uncommonly jolly, said Harry, and just the right thing. I should say it, but it will suit father and mother both, but I don't intend to be a page boy with tight clothes and rows of button. I'll be a groom or a gardener. It was quickly settled that just that as soon as Jerry was well enough, they should remove to the country and that the cab and horses should be sold as soon as possible. This was heavy news for me, for I was not young now and could not look for any improvement in my condition. Since I left Birtwick, I had never been so happy as with my dear master Jerry. But three years of cab work, even under the best conditions, will tell on one's strength, and I felt I was not the horse that I had been. Grant said once that he would take Hotspur, and there were men on the stand who would have bought me, but Jerry said I should not go to cab work again with just anybody, and the governor promised to find a new place for me where I should be comfortable. The day came for going away. Jerry had not been allowed to go out yet, and I never saw him after that New Year's Eve. Polly and the children came to bid me goodbye. Poor old Jack. Dear old Jack, I wish he could, we could take you with us, she said, and then laying her arms on my mane, she put her face close to my neck and kissed me. Dolly was crying and kissed me too. Harry stroked me a great, great deal, but say, said nothing, only he seemed very sad, and so I was led away to my new place. Oh, so it's come to an end, unfortunately, with, um, with Black Beauty being at Jerry's place. So what I'd like you to do before we see what happens to him tomorrow, I'm hoping that it's something nice that uh, that he ends up somewhere nice, um, is you're going to, on Verbal Mash, have a true and false activity to see whether or not you've been paying attention to this chapter. And then tomorrow we'll look at doing some other activities and finding out what's happened to Black Beauty and uh, and whether or not he finds a nice new place to live.